Hello YouTube. In this video, I'm going to outline Quine's arguments for the indeterminacy of meaning. This is one of the most influential ideas in contemporary philosophy of language. Uh, so Quine's conclusion here will be that there is no fact of the matter what a word or sentence means. There are always going to be uh, alternative translations of a sentence, and there's no fact of the matter which translation is the right one. Um, and importantly, this is not a merely epistemic argument. Quine is not merely saying that it's difficult or impossible to discover what sentences mean. He's making the more controversial claim that there just there is no fact of the matter about the meaning to uh, to discover. Um, so this should be a fairly surprising conclusion. I mean, we usually think. Uh, well, surely it's just obvious what we mean when we say things. Uh, I mean, so of course, sometimes people misunderstand each other, so maybe you never really know exactly what I mean, but still, I at least know what I mean when I say things. You know, when I say the sky is blue, even if other people misunderstand me, I at least know what I mean. But if Quine is right, then that's not the case, because actually there's just no fact of the matter about the meaning of anything we say. Okay, so before getting into this, just a quick advert. If you like my channel, you can support me on Patreon or send a one-off donation on PayPal. Um, I offer private tutoring. Please email me if you're interested in that. And if you want to talk about philosophy, join the Discord. The link to that will be in the description. Okay, so let's, uh, let's turn to Quine's argument. Now, Quine appeals to what he calls uh, radical translation. Um, now, radical translation is, well, it, it, Quine asks us to imagine a, uh, a field linguist who goes to a society where people are speaking a language, we call it language L, because we're, we're really creative today, uh, <laughs> language L. Um, anyway, language L is completely foreign to the, uh, to the field linguist. Um, so the linguist knows absolutely nothing about the meanings of the words or sentences, and her task is to translate L into English. So she needs to make a translation manual, which gives us the rules for how to translate any given L sentence into an English sentence. Um, so uh, basically the translation manual of L is going to tell us in English the meaning of the sentences of L. And we would say intuitively that the translation manual is correct just in case the sentences of L and the English sentences that they are paired with have the same meaning. And like that's the, that seems to be the point, right? We're trying to discover the meaning of these L sentences. And so if the L sentences and the English sentences have the same meaning, then our translation manual is correct. Now, uh, again, intuitively, it looks like there's going to be some fact of the matter which translation manual is correct because, you know, that the, like... The, L sentences presumably have some meaning. I mean, suppose, for instance, that L is German, right? So in that case, uh, Schnee ist Weiss, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but Schnee ist Weiss, uh, that will be paired with snow is white. And that is the correct description of the meaning of that German sentence, because Schnee ist Weiss has the same meaning as snow is white. A translation manual for German that pairs Schneeist Weiss with anything other than Snow is White would just be incorrect. <clears throat> okay, so Quine's idea is actually this is this is a mistake. Um, he's going to argue that there is no unique translation manual. This is the indeterminacy of translation. So more precisely we can state indeterminacy of translation as follows. For any language L, we can construct two incompatible translation manuals, T1 and T2, both of which fit all of the possible evidence that is relevant to translation. Indeed, as Quine sees it, there will be an infinite number of incompatible translation manuals, all of which fit all of the possible evidence that is relevant to translation. So uh, T1 and T2 here are translation manuals in the same language. They translate L differently. But there is nothing that can determine whether T1 or T2 is correct. The choice between T1 and T2 can only be made on the basis of pragmatic considerations. I mean, one manual might be simpler than the other. One might strike us as more elegant or more easy to use. But these are just pragmatic factors. Nothing can decide which manual is true. Um, and so then, then Quine's claim is going to be that 
there so so this is this essentially is the, is is the whole process of of radical translation right radical translation is this is this process of you know a field linguist going to a society where she doesn't understand the language and trying to come up with a translation manual for the language um what quine is going to claim is that um there will not be a uniquely correct translation manual but then he will claim that there is nothing more to the meaning of a sentence than what is captured in in our translation manuals. So the indeterminacy of translation, the fact that we can come up with alternative translation manuals that fit all possible evidence, that entails the indeterminacy of meaning. So from the so there's no fact of the matter whether a given translation manual is correct. Well, that entails on Quine's view that there's no fact of the matter what the sentences of a language mean. So from the indeterminacy of translation, we get the indeterminacy of meaning. Okay, well, we will turn to Quine's arguments for the indeterminacy of translation shortly, but, I mean, obviously it's worth pausing to ask, well, like, why should we think that indeterminacy of translation would entail indeterminacy of meaning? I mean, couldn't we... Couldn't we grant that there is no unique translation manual based on the evidence relevant to translation, but then just say, well, you know, all that follows from this is that meanings are not perfectly accessible, right? Like maybe there's more to meaning than what would be discoverable in this uh, pr process of radical translation. Well, the answer to this, I mean, so, so we have to think a bit about some of the background assumptions that Quine is making here. First of all, Quine is a naturalist. As he sees it, all phenomena must be investigated empirically. Meaning is no exception. Quine is trying to develop a naturalistic, empirical approach to the investigation of meaning. Now, a crucial assumption here is that meanings must ultimately be publicly observable and shareable. If there are facts about meaning, those facts must be determined by the behaviour, verbal and otherwise, of speakers of a language. I mean, it's, it's not as though we discover the meanings of terms and sentences in the world independently of us. Words and sentences are arbitrary signs. They don't have any intrinsic meaning. Uh, the, the meanings of words and sentences is something that is going to be somehow constructed through um, through behaviour, through verbal behaviour and, uh, and, and other types of behaviour and so on. Now, I mean, you might say, well, you know, wait a minute, surely the meanings of words and sentences is determined by, um, more by our thoughts, right? By, by our intentions and beliefs. So when I use the word dog, it refers to dogs, to the, to the four-legged mammals, because that's what I intend to refer to, and that's what other people intend to refer to when we use the word dog. But it's worth bearing in mind that, I mean, so, well, a first problem here is that this kind of puts the cart before the horse. In order to have any beliefs or intentions or similar mental states, you need to have meaning, right? You need to have an understanding of meaning. I can't believe that dogs are mammals, for instance, unless I understand what dogs and mammals are and what the sentence dogs or mammals means. Um, so in talking about beliefs and intentions and so on, we're actually already invoking meanings. Um, and the second problem here is that on Quine's view, these mentalistic notions like belief and intention are just as suspect, or at the very least, they're just as in need of clarification as the notion of meaning is. Um, and you know, I mean, certainly when it comes to <clears throat> figuring out people's beliefs and intentions, well, you can only do that on the basis of their behaviour. Um, so, you know, uh, for the Quine, it's not really going to, um, you know, we, we don't really get very far in understanding what's going on with meaning by just saying, oh, well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just in the head, basically. Um, and indeed, one thing to bear in mind here is that even for our own native languages, we were once in the position of the radical translator. So as Quine puts it, radical translation begins at home. We all come into the world with no idea about what any word or sentence means, and then we have to work out the meanings on the basis of, you know, the behaviour of other people and their environment and so on. Like, we, we observe things, we observe people and the environments in which they exist, and then we work out the meanings of their words and sentences. So 
Every fact about the meaning of a language is available in principle to somebody who has no prior exposure to the language, who learns the language through radical translation. And it follows that there is no more to meaning than what can in principle be found in this project of constructing a translation manual. So that's why the indeterminacy of translation entails the indeterminacy of meaning, at least for Quine. Okay, so before looking at the arguments, I think it's worth just bearing in mind or uh, uh, noting a potential confusion about Quine's thesis, because you, so, so it might be thought that at first glance at least, Quine is just saying something completely uncontroversial and trivial. Because you might say, well, hang on, it's not surprising at all that we can't perfectly translate one language into another. Um, a concept in one language may have no exact equivalent in another language. Um, so Michael Morris in his Introduction to Philosophy of Language gives the example that uh, the Greek word logos is translatable as well, sometimes it's translated as speech, sometimes as word, sometimes as reason, sometimes reckoning, sometimes account, and many more. None of these exactly capture the meaning of logos. So it looks like, oh, this is a case where translation is indeterminate, right? It's just not clear exactly which of the... I mean, logos doesn't exactly mean any of these, but they're both. any of these translations will be acceptable in at least some contexts. So, yeah, it's indeterminate. And this sort of thing is... I mean, this is, you know, perfectly standard when we're trying to translate languages, right? So, okay, uh, Quine's thesis then looks like it's going to just be trivial. But this is not what Quine is talking about. Um, and in fact, the, the sort of picture of language, or at least what I've just said there, the kind of picture of language that is assumed by what I've just said there, is probably incompatible with Quine's thesis. So... But think about it, so intuitively, right, why is it that we can't perfectly capture the word logos in English? Well, intuitively, it's because there is some fact of the matter about the meaning of the word logos, which is available only to the people who talk and think in Greek. There are facts about the meanings of Greek words that cannot be stated in other languages. But Quine denies this. For Quine, there is no fact of the matter about the meaning of the word logos. There is nothing that our various translations can be correct or incorrect about. So, in fact, on Quine's view, any of these suggested translations, you know, speech, word, reason, they might count as just giving the meaning of logos and like that and like lit and just completely or at least as accurately as possible, just giving the meaning of Logos, right? Like, and there's just nothing more to the meaning of Logos than what is given by these different translations. Um, so Quine, one of the things Quine objects to here is what he calls the myth of the museum. On the traditional view of how language works, a language is like a museum of meanings inside our heads. So we have this mental museum. The exhibits are the meanings, and the labels of the exhibits are words or sentences. And you can think that like when we, when we change a language, we switch the labels. So there's an exhibit that is the meaning of snow is white, right? Like so, the, so the meaning of the sentence snow is white, there's this meaning, snow is white. And then the label, it has the label, the English sentence, snow is white. So you have the meaning, snow is white, labelled by the English sentence, snow is white. If you change the language to German, you change the labels. Now the same meaning is labelled with the German sentence, Schnee ist Weiss. So similarly then, you might assume that there are meanings that have a label in one language, but that have no label in other languages. There's some meaning that is labelled with the Greek word logos, and no English word labels this meaning. The problem with this whole picture of meaning, according to Quine, is that it assumes that, mean, that the meanings of a person's utterances are, and I quote, somehow determinate in his mind beyond what might be implicit in his overt behaviour. And Quine rejects that. Um, for, you know, for Quine, meaning can't float free from observable behaviour. So, I, I mean, for Logos, well, there just is no determinate meaning of Logos. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's no determinate meaning of any word or sentence. Um, so there is no sort of, there is no fact that we might capture or fail to capture in our attempted translations. 
Okay then. Well, with all of that said, then we can turn to uh, Quine's arguments for the for the indeterminacy of translation. He has two arguments for this thesis: the argument from below and the argument from above. So let's start with the argument from below. Okay, consider the field linguist who is trying to translate L into English. The only evidence available to her are, are facts about the behaviour of L speakers plus facts about their surrounding environment. And this is the data that she's going to use to construct our translation manual. Again, she has no prior understanding of the meanings of any L sentences. She starts this pro process completely blind. Now, crucial for her project is what Quine calls stimulus meaning. The stimulus meaning of a sentence um, consists in three things. So, first of all, there are the sensory stimulations that prompt a speaker to assent to the sentence. That's the affirmative stimulus meaning. There are the sensory stimulations that prompt the speaker to dissent from the sentence, the negative stimulus meaning, and sensory stimulations that leave the speaker undecided. Um, so, you know, I mean, in, in English, for instance, if I <clears throat> walk out the house on a sunny day, well, I, I, I open the door and I'm, I, I then receive certain sensory stimulations and um, the sentence, it is a sunny day, if you ask me whether or not I agree with that, I'd say I agree, right? So there are certain sensory stimulations, namely the, uh, you know, the clear blue sky and the sun and so on, that's going to, that those sensory stimulations prompt me to assent to the sentence, it is a sunny day. Um, and they're similarly going to uh, uh, other sensory stimulations, for instance, if I was to walk outside and it's cloudy, well, that would prompt me to dissent from the sentence, it is a sunny day. So, you know, uh, we're just talking about, like, the the things that the, the sense, the sense data, sensory stimulations, um, the immediate things you're experiencing in your external environment that would prompt assent or dissent or whatever from a sentence. Uh, now, it's important to note that stimulus meaning is very different from the standard notion of meaning because, well, first of all, there are some sentences that I might endorse regardless of what sensory stimulations I'm presented with. Sentences like one plus one equals two, or nothing is both red all over and green all over. These sentences, I mean, I'm, I'm, if, you, if you ask me, like, do I agree with one plus one equals two? Do I agree that nothing is both red all over and green all over? I mean, I'm going to say yes to that in pretty much all circumstances. Um, so, I mean, unless somebody like, you know, offers me money to disagree with them or something like that. But pretty much every, all kind of everyday circumstances, I will agree with those sentences. So these sentences have the same or at least very similar stimulus meanings. But of course, they don't have the same meaning in the conventional sense. So st stimulus meaning is just a matter of which sensory stimulations prompt assent, dissent or withholding of judgment. The stimu stimulus meaning is crucial here because it can be identified objectively. It's, it's public, it's shareable, it's observable. So the translator can use stimulus meanings as the basic data for her translation. Now, first of all, though, in order to get stimulus meaning, the translator needs to identify assent and dissent. Now, as Quine notes, this is not straightforward. Uh, a facial expression that counts as a sign of assent in one culture may be the sign of dissent in another. Uh, so all the translator can do is form a hypothesis from her observations, draw some predictions from it, and, you know, see if it works out. So suppose that the language L contains the word gabagai. And the, the linguist notices that when she says gavagai in the presence of rabbits, the natives tend to answer evet. And when she says gavagai when there are no rabbits present, the natives tend to answer yok. Um, and similarly, you know, with other words, they, she frequently hears evet and yok in these sorts of uh, patterns. And so that suggests that evet and yok mean yes and no. Uh, she also notices that when she repeats something that one of the natives says, the native will tend to respond with evet. She notices that use of the word evet tends to have a more serene effect on the native's behavior than using the word yok. So, okay, we have this hypothesis then that evet means yes and yok means no. Well, now that the linguist has a hypothesis about what indicates assent and dissent, she can start working on other sentences using <clears throat> stimulus meaning. So, suppose we have the sentence Yo, Gavagai. Uh, yo, Gavagai tends to elicit assent when there are rabbits present and dissent when there are no rabbits present. 
So Yo Gabba Guy in the L language and There is a Rabbit in English have the same stimulus meaning, or at least a very similar stimulus meaning. So that is that is to say the natives will assent to and dissent from the sentence Yo Gabba Guy given the same sensory stimulations that will lead English speakers to assent to and dissent from the sentence, there is a rabbit. So the translator forms the hypothesis that yo guy translates to, there is a rabbit. Um, yo guy here is, uh, is an observation sentence. Um, so speakers tend to assent or dissent, assent to or dissent from it in very specific conditions. Um, their ascent or descent doesn't tend to vary too much with information that is not available to simple observation. So we, you know, we find that they ascent to it when there's a rabbit present and they dissent otherwise. Translation starts with these simple observation sentences. The translator is looking for sentences that can be taken to describe immediate experience on particular occasions. Of course, that's a vague category. Uh, even observation sentences will be difficult to translate, but on identifying an event that prompts the speaker to utter a sentence, she can then translate the sentence to a sentence of her own language that describes the same event. So, you know, the thought is like the external environment is a shared world. So like sentences that, um, you know, sentences that are prompted by states of the immediate external environment provide the most straightforward entry into translation. OK, so the translator proposes the hypothesis that Gavagai means rabbit. This links the L term with the English term. And we can suppose that this hypothesis is never disconfirmed. Uh, so, you know, she takes it that Gavagai and rabbit refer to the same thing. But now there's a problem because there's a variety of alternative translations that are compatible with the stimulus meaning of Yo Gavagai. The translator could translate Yo Gavagai as there is a rabbit, but she could also translate it as there is an undetached rabbit part. So, for instance, you know, the rabbit's tail or the rabbit's ears. Um, these are all undetached rabbit parts. Or she could translate it to mean there is an instance of rabbithood or there is a brief temporal segment of a rabbit or there is a shadow of a rabbit or whatever. The stimulus meanings cannot decide between these translations. This is because whenever there is a rabbit, there's also an undetached rabbit part and vice versa. Whenever there is a rabbit, there is an instance of rabbithood and vice versa. Whenever there's a rabbit, there's a shadow of a rabbit and vice versa. There is nothing in the observable behavior of the natives that can settle which of these translations is right. Uh, so there is no fact of the matter which of these translations is right. This is what Quine calls the uh, inscrutability of reference. Um, there's no way to tell what Gavagai refers to. Does it pick out the rabbit? Does it pick out some part of the rabbit? Does it pick out rabbit hood as a whole? Does it pick out something else entirely? I mean, of course, in all likelihood, the translator will take Gavagai to refer to rabbits, but that's, that's just a pragmatic choice. Um, there is nothing that can settle whether it really refers to rabbits. Uh, so, and then, of course, the assumption is, well, this indeterminacy at the level of reference is going to lead to indeterminacy in the translation of whole sentences. Um, now, OK, we might think, well, maybe this is a bit too fast, right? Surely there's further evidence that will allow us to decide which is the correct translation. Suppose we have figured out... Um, the terms in L for demonstratives, so terms like this and that, and the terms for numerical identity, for one thing being the same as another thing, and suppose that we know how to ask questions in L. Then we point to part of the rabbit, such as the ears, and we point to another part of the rabbit, such as the tail, and while doing so, we ask the question, uh, see hit gavagai emes saw hat gavagai, um, and that is to say, is this Gavagai the same as that Gavagai? Well, if the native answers yes to this, if the native assents to this, then we have evidence that Gavagai should be translated uh, sh should be translated to mean rabbit and not undetached rabbit part. After all, if there are that, uh, so there are in fact two different undetached rabbit parts here. The rabbit ears 
are not the same undetached part as the rabbit tail. So if the native agrees that this gaba guy, when we're pointing to the ears, is the same as that gaba guy, when we're pointing to the tail, then we can be confident that gaba guy refers to the whole rabbit. Or at the very least, it doesn't refer to undetached rabbit parts. So, you know, I mean, okay. Um, yes, you know, if we're talking about stimulus meanings just with respect to the sentence, yo, gaba guy, then maybe there's this indeterminacy. But, like, we can ask questions and we can... Uh, we can remove the indeterminacy. Um, unfortunately, this isn't going to work. Um, so, Quine points out, well, th what we're assuming here is that emas should be, should be translated to mean same thing. So, if we're interpreting emas to mean same thing, then our question, si hit gavagai emas sa hat gavagai, that means something like, is this gavagai the same thing as that gavagai? Then when we point to different parts of the same rabbit and the native assents to our question, we take it that Gavagai refers to the whole rabbit. So Gavagai just means rabbit. But there are alternative translations of emas. Emas could mean is an undetached part of the same thing. Then our question, see hit Gavagai emas sa hat Gavagai, means something like, is this Gavagai an undetached part of the same thing as that Gavagai? Well, uh... Let's suppose that Gavagai means undetached rabbit part. In that case, we would expect the native to respond affirmatively to this question when we point to different parts of the same rabbit. Um, after all, the rabbit ears are indeed an undetached part of the same thing as the rabbit's tail. So on this interpret, so if we interpret emas to mean is an undetached part of the same thing, then on that interpretation, Gavagai means undetached rabbit part. Um, and the same kind of problem, Quine thinks, is going to arise for any other questions we might ask. There will always be alternative interpretations of the questions such that an affirmative answer can be taken to support the translation of Gavagai as undetached rabbit part. Even in the idealised scenario where we had access to all possible facts that could determine a correct translation manual, there would still be an infinite number of alternative translation manuals compatible with those facts. So, okay, so does this argument succeed? Well, one objection here is that um, Quine has just overlooked other ways to specify a determinate reference. So here's a suggestion from Robert Kirk in his essay in the uh, Cambridge Companion to Quine. So Kirk says, you know, stimulus meanings are not the only evidence that's relevant to translation. We also have to consider the connections that a term or a sentence has with other terms and sentences in the language. So suppose that in addition to the word gavagai, L has other expressions, such as gavagai X and gavagai Y. And suppose we find that the suffixes X and Y are attached to many other object terms. And, you know, for one reason or another, we end up forming the hypothesis that X means undetached part of, and Y means temporal stage of. So, Gavagai means rabbit, Gavagai X means undetached rabbit part, Gavagai Y means temporal stage of a rabbit. All three terms have the same stimulus meanings, at least broadly speaking. I mean, a, a speaker will generally assent to and dissent from Gavagai in the same situations in which she will assent to and dissent from Gavagai X. But... So what? I mean, we can't just ignore the connections that these terms have to the rest of the language. Uh, we have good reason to think that Gavagai just means rabbit, while Gavagai X means undetached rabbit part. Of course, you know, Quine may well point out that it is indeterminate whether X means undetached part of and Y means temporal stage of. There will be other ways of translating these terms that is compatible with the verbal behaviour of L speakers. Well, maybe, but... But why? <laughs> I mean, you know, we'd need we'd need some argument for this. So the question is, why, when we take into account the interconnections between words and sentences of the language, should we think that we will be unable to fix a determinate translation manual? Um, I mean, the trouble here, I suppose, is that for any specific example we might give of apparently indeterminate translations, we might always wonder whether there could be further evidence, you know, just in terms of you know, either questions we could ask or connections we could find, you know, to other terms and sentences in the language that would break the tie between the alternative translations. 
Um, obviously, when we play out this thought experiment of the radical translator, uh, it's, you know, we, we use it, we, we're dealing with like simple toy examples. Um, you know, we're not really getting into a lot of detail about how this language works. Um, so you might, so, so it's very easy to think, well, hang on a minute, like, why are we just, why are we assuming that we're not going to come across evidence like Kirk has suggested here that would allow us to figure out whether Gavagai means, you know, rabid or undetached rabid part or whatever. So Quine does actually have a general argument for thinking that there will always be alternative translations compatible with all possible data. And this is the argument from above. And so in later work, Quine actually said that, you know, really the, the argument from above is what's doing the work here. Um, that the argument, the argument from above is the important one. <laughs> um, so the argument from above rests on the underdetermination thesis. Uh, underdetermination is a, uh, a central problem in philosophy of science. Uh, theories are judged against observation. So theories make predictions about what will be observed and then they are confirmed or refuted by our observations. If a theory entails a true observation sentence, it is confirmed. If it entails a false observation sentence, it is refuted. At least, you know, that's... Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of wrinkles to that. But basically, yeah, theories, theories are judged against observation. Um, but now there's a problem. Any scientific theory will be underdetermined by the observational data, uh, which is to say that even if we had all possible observational data, there would be an infinite number of different theories that are all consistent with that data. Different theories can be empirically equivalent. Different theories can make exactly the same predictions and so entail the same observational data. Um, for for a, just a very simple example of this, <clears throat> just take any theory at all um, and then just add and then just add add um, the claim God exists, right? So any any theory, you know, just uh, I don't know quantum mechanics and then just say and God exists, right? Well, now you have uh, an alternative theory um, which is still going to be totally compatible with the data. It might not be a particularly appealing theory. You know, you might say, well, hang on a minute. We, uh, we've made our theory, um, we've made our theory far less simple. You know, there's 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 lots of problems like just adding that God exists. But um, the point is, is that you know, so if you have just standard quantum mechanics and then you have quantum mechanics plus the claim that God exists, uh, it's going to be compatible with all the same data. It makes the same predictions. Um, and actually, there's just going to be an infinite number of these theories that you can you can come up with. Uh, to get a handle on how this works, you can think of observations as being like points on a graph, and then the theories as being the lines that we draw through these points. So I have you know, a graph here, and you think, okay, well, you draw this line, right? Just a line, that nice, simple, little curved line like that. But clearly, there's an infinite number of lines that can be drawn through these points, right? There's a lot of weird lines. You can you can, you can do it however, however you want, as long as the line goes through the points. Um, so... No, now, the thing is, is that no matter how much data we add, no matter how many points we put on that graph, there's always going to be an infinite number of lines you can draw through them. In principle, there's just no way of getting around that. As long as there's some space between the points, you can have an infinite number of lines through them. So this is basically the underdetermination of theory by data, right? Our observations are like these points on a graph, and then the theory is like the line we're drawing through it. And there's always going to be uh, various different ways of doing that. Now, underdetermination is a problem for any theory whatsoever. So we can immediately see that just as physical theories will be underdetermined by the observational data, so translation manuals, which is basically a theory about the meaning of a language, translation manuals will be underdetermined by the linguistic data. So immediately we have un underdetermination here. Now, what Quine wants to say, though, is that the indeterminacy of translation is not just a special case of underdetermination. The, indeter the indeterminacy of translation is additional to the underde underdetermination of physical theory. And there's a couple of reasons for this. So first of all, underdetermination in, in general is an epistemic problem. So it's a problem about how we can know which theory is correct. Since there are multiple different physical theories that are all compatible with the data, we can't be sure which of these is correct. 
But still, we assume that there is a correct theory. We assume that there is a fact of the matter about which theory is correct. There is a mind-independent world which our theories can match or fail to match. The situation is different with translation manuals. As we've noted, on Quine's view, the observational evidence is what determines meaning. There is nothing more that meaning can be. And I mean, this is a, a reasonably intuitive idea, right? So that so the Quine's sort of picture is, well, the behaviour of physical objects, you know, particles and so on, that has nothing to do with us. Particles are what they are, they have the properties they do, they behave the way they do, regardless of what we say or think. Um, by contrast, m you know, meaning, right, that's something that, if there's meaning, it's something that must be constructed by minds and behaviours of human beings. So, like, if translation manuals are underdetermined by the behaviours of speakers of a language, the underdetermination isn't merely epistemic, because the behaviour of speakers of a language, that's what fixed the facts about meaning. Um, so in this case, underdetermination becomes, uh, it, you know, well, it, it becomes sort of ontological. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's it's that there's, it's not just in, it's not just that there's underdetermination. There is indeterminacy, no facts of the matter. A second reason why the, un the, the indeterminacy of translation is additional to um, standard underdetermination. So the second reason, even once we have selected a given physical theory, this still does not fix the translation manual for a, for a language. So underdetermination in physics is an epistemic problem. We can't be sure which physical theory describes the world correctly. However, once we have settled on a physical theory, once we take the leap of faith, as it were, and select some theory of physics, then we assume that this theory tells us, in principle, all the truths about the world. Quine is, of course, a physicalist. Uh, in his view, everything that there is in the world is determined by the nature an arrangement of microphysical states. So yes, there will be alternative theories of what these microphysical states are like, but each of these theories is supposed to tell us everything else about the world. The facts about chemistry, for instance, reduce to the facts about physics. The facts about biology reduce to the facts about chemistry, and then to the facts about physics, and so on. So like, we understand the biological organism as being composed of cells, then those cells are composed of molecules, those molecules composed of chemical elements, those elements composed of protons and neutrons, and so it goes. Um, and there is nothing more to a molecule than the arrangement of elements. There's nothing more to a cell than the arrangement of molecules. So once you know all the physical facts, then the, the rest of it, you know, the chemical facts, biological facts and so on, are no longer under, underdetermined. Once you have a, the correct physical theory, there's no longer any underdetermination with respect to chemical facts, biological facts, and so on. Those higher level facts are fixed by the physical facts. The trouble with constructing a translation manual is that even once we have selected a given physical theory, this still does not fix the translation manual for a language. Even if we were to know all of the physical truths, translation manuals would still be underdetermined. So alternative translation manuals are compatible with all the physical facts. So there is an additional underdetermination at work in the case of translation. And since Quine is a physicalist, since he thinks that all the facts are just reducible to physical facts or fixed by the physical facts, well, that means that in the case of translation, there's just no fact of the matter which translation is correct. Um, okay, then, so that's the claim. But then, like, why is there this additional underdetermination in the case of... Um, in the case of translation, like, why are we saying that even once you've uh, f fixed the physical facts, this will not fix the translation manual for a language? Well, suppose that the translator is trying to translate the physical theory endorsed by L speakers. The first task, as before, is to translate the observation sentences. Some sentence of L will be translated to, for instance, there is a white streak in the cloud chamber, or there is a small bright point at the centre of the circular shadow. You know, So these, these are the sentences that describe immediate observations. But now, given the underdetermination of physical theory, we know that fixing the observation sentences does not fix the physical theory that a person accepts. 
there will always be multiple physical theories that are compatible with any set of observations. So even once we know the observation sentences that L speakers accept, this won't determine which physical theory they accept. As, so as Quine puts it, insofar as the truth of a physical theory is underdetermined by observables, the translation of a foreigner's physical theory is underdetermined by the translation of his observation sentences. If our physical theory can vary though all possible observations be fixed, then our translation of his physical theory can vary though our translations of all possible observation reports on his part be fixed. So, you know, we have two translators, they both accept exactly the same theories of the world, exactly the same physical theories, then they try to translate L. They start by constructing a translation of the observation sentences, and let's say they both come up with exactly the same translation of those sentences. Well, the question is, what is the broader theory that these L speakers accept? What is the physical theory that they accept? The first translator attributes theory T1. Um, T1 entails the observation sentences the native accept. The second translator attributes a different theory, T2. Again, T2 entails the observation sentences that the natives accept. T1 and T2 are empirically equivalent. They entail the same observations. So they're both compatible with the observation sentences that the natives accept. So as Quine sees it, there's just going to be no facts in the matter whether T1 or T2 is the correct translation of their theory. So that's the basic idea. All the facts about the world are physical facts. Once we have which means that once we have selected a physical theory, we can take it that this theory tells us everything there is to know about the world. It tells us all the physical facts, so it tells us all the facts. But translation manuals will be underdetermined even by the physical theory we accept. And the reason is that we are, you know, we're, we're never forced to attribute the same physical theory to the natives. We could interpret them as holding, you know, different physical theories. Um, once we, so once we choose a physical theory, there will be multiple translation manuals for L. So there's no fact of the matter, which is the correct translation manual for L. That is the claim. Uh, that's the argument. And that is the end of this particular video. So um, uh, I hope you found it interesting. And that's all. <laughs> Thanks for watching.